Hello YouTube, my name is Neil and we're studying for the MCATs today. Today we're in the Physics and Math Review, Chapter 4, Fluids. Hidden beneath the waves of the Mediterranean Sea at depths of more than 4,000 meters lie three lakes. The water in these seas under the sea is so salty, five, time, five to ten times saltier than the sea water that sits above it that its extreme density prevents it from mixing with the ocean water above, forming a layer of separation not unlike that between the oil and water in a bottle of salad dressing. These underwater lakes behave eerily like their most common cousins found at sea level. They have tides, shorelines, beach ridges, and swash zones. When deep sea exploratory vehicles set down on their surfaces, the vessels bob up and down causing ripples to emanate outward like a stone dropped in a pond. Suboceanic lakes and rivers present a particularly fascinating opportunity to illustrate the physics of fluids and solids. This chapter covers the important concepts and principles of fluid mechanics as they are tested on the MCAT. We will begin with a review of some important terms and measurements, including density and pressure. Our next topic will be hydrostatics, the branch of fluid mechanics that characterizes the behavior of fluids at rest. We'll turn We'll then turn our attention to fluid dynamics, including Bernoulli's equation and the aerodynamics of flight. Finally, the chapter concludes with a discussion of fluid dynamics in physiology, examining the properties that motivate the movement of blood and air within the body. Characteristics and fluids of solids. Fluids are characterized by their ability to flow and conform to the shapes of their containers. Solids, on the other hand, do not flow and are rigid enough to retain a shape independent of their containers. Both liquids and gases are fluids. The natural gas, methane, that many of us use to cook flows through pipes to the burners of our stoves and ovens, and the air that we breathe flows in and out of our lungs, filling the spaces of our respiratory tract and the alveoli. Fluids and solids share certain characteristics. Both can exert forces perpendicular to their surfaces, although only solids can withstand sheer tangential forces. Fluids can impose larger perpendicular forces. Falling into water from a significant height can be just as painful as falling onto a solid surface. Density. All fluids and solids are characterized by the ratio of their mass to their volume. This is known as density, which is a scalar quantity and therefore has no direction. P equals M over V, where rho represents density, M is mass, and V is volume. The SI units for density are kilograms per meter cubed, but you may find it convenient to use grams per milliliter or grams per, per cubic centimeter, both of which may be seen on the MCAT. Remember that a millimeter, milliliter and a cubic centimeter are the same volume. Word of caution, students sometimes assume that a milliliter and cubic centimeter are equivalent. Then so must be the liter and the cubic meter. This is absolutely not the case. In fact, there are a thousand liters in a cubic meter. For the MCAT, it is important to know the density of water, which is one gram per centimeter cubed, which is the same as a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. The weight of any volume of a given substance with a known density can be calculated by multiplying the substance density by its volume and the acceleration due to gravity. This is a calculation that appears frequently when working through buoyancy problems on test day. The force of gravity equals PVG. The density of a fluid is often compared to that of pure water at 1 atm and 4 degrees Celsius, a variable called specific gravity. It is at this combination of pressure and temperature that water has a density of exactly one. The specific gravity is given by specific gravity equals rho over one gram per centimeter cubed. This is a unitless number that is usually expressed as a decimal. The specific gravity can be used as a tool for determining if an object will sink or float in water, as described later in this chapter. Hmm. 
Krishna. It's really, it's really interesting. I guess uh, 60% is all it wants me to go. Don't want me to move up here either. All right. Example, find the specific gravity of benzene given that its density is 877. Specific gravity equals rho over... All right, so density is rho, right? Mass over volume is density. So just uh, that over 1 is its specific gravity, 877 over 1. The ratio of the density of benzene to the density of water is the specific gravity. Either the numerator must be converted to grams per cubic centimeter, or the denominator must be given kilograms per meter cubed. So in this case, 877 over so since this is in kilograms you got to go with the thousand and that being less than one is the point I guess so benzene will float in water Pressure is a ratio of the force per unit area. The equation for pressure is P equals F over A, where P is pressure, F is the magnitude of the normal force vector, and A is the area. The SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, which is equivalent to the Newton per square meter. Other commonly used units of pressure are millimeters of mercury, tor, and the atmosphere. Millimeters of mercury and tor are identical units. The unit of atmosphere is based on the average atmospheric pressure at sea level. Conversion between pascals, millimeters, mercury, tors, and, eight, and atmospheres are as follows. 1.013 times 10 to the 5 equals 760 millimeters of milligram, millimeters of mercury, so the same as tors, which is 1. Pressure is a scalar quantity and therefore has a magnitude but no direction. It is easy to assume that pressure has a direction because it is related to a force, which is a vector. However, note that it is the magnitude of normal force that is used. No matter where one positions a given surface, the pressure exerted on that surface within a closed container will be the same, neglected, neglecting gravity. For example, if we place a surface inside a closed container filled with gas, the individual molecules which are moving randomly within space will exert pressure that is the same at all points within the container. Because the pressure is the same at all points along the walls of the container and within the space of the container itself, pressure applies in all directions at any point and therefore is a scalar rather than a vector. Of course, because pressure is a ratio of force to area, when unequal pressures are exerted against objects, the forces acting on the object will add in vectors, possibly resulting in acceleration. It's this difference in pressures that causes air to rush in and out of <coughs> the lungs during respiration. Windows uh, to burst outward during a tornado and the plastic covering a broken car window to bubble outward when the car is moving. Note that when gravity is present, this also results in a pressure differential, which we will explore with hydrostatics later in this chapter. The window of a skyscraper measures 2.0 meters by 3.5 meters. If a storm passes by and lowers the pressure outside a window to 
0.997 atmospheres, while the pressure inside of the building remains 1, what is the net force pushing on the window? Force over area. In this case, the area is going to be 2 times 3.5. And the force, I guess, is going to be just 1 minus 0 0.997. And also the force is 0.997. Oh, we don't have to worry about that here. Well, pressure is equals F over A, so F equals PA. <coughs> and we have 1 minus 0 0.997 atmospheres. That's the pressure. Here is going to be 2 times 3.5. It's going to be 7. One minus nine nine up uh, one. So are we turning this into Pascals here? If the multiply by 1.013 times 10 to the fifth, why do we have to put it in Pascals? All right, they're on Pascals. <laughs> so we're also going to multiply this by this conversion factor of 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. Mm -hmm. Multiply that by that. Times seven times. Let's turn this into scientific. 1.013. Whoops. 3. E. 5. We get two. One, two, seven point three. And they get two one two eight, which is close. <laughs> so they did a little bit of approximation here. Just times ten to the five instead of one point oh one three times ten to the five. But we did all right. These are Newtons, of course. All right. Absolute pressure. At this very moment, countless trillions of air molecules are exerting tremendous pressure on our bodies. With a total force of about 2 times 10 to the 5 Newtons. Of course, we don't actually feel this pressure because our internal organs exert a pressure that perfectly balances it. Atmospheric pressure changes with altitude. Residents of Denver at 5280 feet above sea level experience atmospheric pressure equal to 632 millimeters of mercury, whereas travelers making their way through Death Valley 282 feet below sea level experience atmospheric pressure equal to 767 millimeters of mercury. Atmospheric pressure impacts a number of processes, including hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen and the boiling point of liquids. 
absolute hydrostatic pressure is the total pressure that is exerted on an object that is submerged in a fluid. Remember that fluids include both liquids and gases. The equation for this absolute pressure is P equals P naught plus rho G Z, where P is the absolute pressure, P naught is the incident or ambient pressure. Rho is the density of the fluid, G is the acceleration due to gravity, and Z is the depth of the object. Do not make the mistake of assuming that P0 always stands for atmospheric pressure. In open air and most day-to-day -day situations, P0 is equal to one atmosphere. But in other fluid systems, the surface pressure may be higher or lower than atmospheric pressure. In a closed container, such as a pressure cooker, the pressure at the surface may be higher than atmospheric pressure. This is, in, exact, in fact, exactly the point of a pressure cooker, which allows food to cook at higher temperatures. This is because the increased pressure raises the boiling point of water in the food, thus reducing the cooking time and pre preventing loss of moisture. Gauge pressure. When you check the pressure in your car or bike tires using a device known as a gauge, you are measuring the gauge pressure which is the difference between absolute pressure inside the tire and the atmospheric pressure outside the tire. In other words, gauge pressure is the amount of pressure in a closed space above the and beyond atmospheric pressure. This is a more common pressure measurement than absolute pressure, and the equation is P gauge equals P minus P atmosphere, which equals P naught plus PGZ minus P atmosphere. Note that when P naught equals P atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, then the gauge pressure equals P minus P naught, which equals P or rho GZ at a depth Z. A diver in the ocean, an astronaut in the ocean, is 20 millimeters below the, or meters below the surface. What is the gauge pressure at her depth? What is the absolute pressure she experiences? Note the density of seawater is 1025 kilograms per. Gauge pressure is P minus atmospheric pressure. In this case, P is P naught plus PGZ. So PGZ, P naught, we're going to assume is 1 plus rho is the density of just water, is it? Is that what which is one. I guess plus one times I uh, gravity nine point eight. Z is the depth, twenty meters. So that's our P G Z plus P naught. We're gonna assume this is P, and we're gonna assume that that is 9.8 times 20 plus 1. I'm going to assume that's 197. Are we okay so far on that? What did they do? They did, oh, uh, they did this number. 1025 times 9.8 times 20. Oh, because they give us the density of seawater. So instead of that, we're going to replace that with 1025 plus 1 times 9.8 times 20. Not this. One ninety six plus. 1025 equals 1221. 
Ah, I did this wrong. I messed this up again. Let's try this again. All right, so in this case, P, the gauge pressure is just P, G, Z. No plus P, rho here. That's not what they're doing, at least. They just got the P, G, Z. That's not what we learned. All right. Rho G Z rather Which equals zero two five. Nine point eight is the force of gravity at a depth of twenty meters. Two O O nine zero O and at least we got that right that time or two point O one times ten to the fifth. Pascals. And then it says, then we solve for the absolute pressure using the absolute pressure equation, where the atmospheric pressure plus the gauge pressure. So in this case, 1.013 times 10 to the fifth plus this number, 2.01 times 10 to the fifth. Comes to three zero two. Oops. Pascals three point oh two times ten to the fifth Pascals. All right, before you move on, how does gauge pressure relate to the pressure exerted by a column of fluid? Uh, I guess it is the force of gravity times the density of the fluid times the depth expressed by this equation, PGZ. What is the relationship between weight and density? Well... Mass divided by volume equals density. What is the SI unit for pressure, uh, Pascals? What are other common units of pressure? Uh, atmospheres and uh, millimeters of mercury. True or false? Density is a scalar quantity. I think that's true. It is, we learn that it is a scalar quantity. Oh, wait. We learned that pressure is a scalar. Is density a scalar? Oh, let's find out. Let's just look at the end and find out, right? Gauge pressure is equal to the pressure exerted by a column of fluid plus the ambient pressure above the fluid minus the atmospheric pressure. All right. 
Weight is the density times volume and acceleration due to gravity. SI units is pascals. True, density is directionless and is thus a scalar quantity. Great. Hydrostatics is the study of fluids at rest and the forces and pressures associated with standing fluids. A proper understanding of hydrostatics is important for the MCAT because the test makers frequently include passages and questions on hydraulics and buoyancy. All right, for fluids that are incompressible, that is, fluids with volumes that cannot be reduced by any significant degree through application of pressure, a change in pressure will be transmitted undiminished to every portion of the fluid and to the walls of the containing vessel. This is Pascal's principle. For example, an unopened carton of milk could be considered an incompressible fluid in a closed container. If you were to squeeze a container exerting increased pressure on the sides of the milk carton, the applied pressure would be transmitted through the entire volume of the milk. The cap were to suddenly pop off, the resulting geyser of milk would be evidence of this increased pressure. It's a fun visual. One application of Pascal's principle can be seen in hydraulic systems. These systems take advantage of the near incomprehensible liquids. Of the near incomprehensibility of liquids to generate mechanical advantages, which as we've seen in our discussion of inclined planes and pulleys in chapter two, allows us to accomplish a certain amount of work more easily by applying reduced forces. Many heavy machines use hydraulics, including car brakes, bulldozers, cranes, and lifts. Figure 4.1 shows a simple diagram of a hydraulic lift. Let's determine how, much, how such a lift could allow an auto mechanic to raise a heavy car with far less effort, far less force than the weight of the car. We have a closed container that is filled with an incompressible liquid. On the left side of the lift, there is a piston of cross-sectional area A1. When F1 and equal to with a cross-sectional area A1, when this piston is pushed down the column, it exerts a force with a magnitude equal to F1 and generates a pressure equal to P1. This piston displaces a volume of liquid equal to A1D1. Cross-sectional area times the distance gives a volume. Because the liquid inside is incomprehensible, incompressible rather, the same volume of fluid must be displaced on the right side of the hydro hydraulic lift, where we find a second piston with a much larger surface area. The pressure generated by piston 1 is transmitted undiminished to all points within the system, including A2. A2 is larger than A1 by some factor. The magnitude of the force F2 exerted against A2 must be greater than F1 by the same factor so that P1 and P2 are the same, according to Pascal's principle. P equals F1 over A1, which equals F2 over A2. So F2 equals the force of A1 times the ratio of the area of A2 to A1. So if this is positive, we can make this larger than this. So if A2 is larger, we can make the force F2 larger. What this series of equations shows us is that hydraulic machines generate output force by magnifying an input force by a factor equal to the ratio of the cross-sectional area of the larger piston to that of the smaller piston. This does not violate the law of energy conservation. An analysis of the input and output work in a frictionless system reveals that there is indeed conservation of energy. As mentioned above, the volume of fluid displaced by piston 1 is equal to the volume of fluid displaced at piston 2. Combining the equations for pressure and volume, we can generate an equation for work. Uh, should I write this down? The volume of a... Of D2 equals D1. Combining the equations for pressure and volume, we can generate an equation for work as the product of constant pressure and volume change, as this is an isobaric process. So here we have work equals P delta V 
which equals F1 over A1 times A1 D1, which equals F2 over A2, A2 D2, So the A's cancel out, and you have just F1, D1 equals F2, D2. This shows us the familiar form of work as a product of the magnitude of force and displacement times the cosine of the angle between them, which is zero in this case. Because the factor by which D1 is larger than D2 is equal to the factor by which F2 is larger than F1, we see that no additional work has been done or accounted for. The greater force F2 is moving through a smaller distance D2. Therefore, an auto mechanic needs only to exert a small force over a small area through a, larger, through a large distance to generate a much larger force over a larger area through a smaller distance. So he has to pump this side more to get that side to move a distance, right? <clears throat> a hydraulic press has a piston of radius five centimeters, which pushes down on an enclosed fluid. A 50 kilogram weight rests on the piston. Another piston in contact with the system has a radius of 20 centimeters. Taking G to be 10, what force is needed on the larger piston to keep the press in equilibrium? So you got a 20 centimeter piston, you got a five centimeter piston, and to keep it equal, we're gonna do uh, F2 equals, F2 equals F1, and two over one. So we'll put, F1 is going to be 50 times 9.8, and A2 is going to be 20 over 5. This should be F2, right? Oh, wait, we want the force to be the same. Did I do that right? 50 times 10? Oh yeah, they said to make this 10, didn't they? Times 20 over 5 equals... I could do that in my head. 50 times 10 is 500 times 4, right? is going to be 2,000. Let's see what they did here. They have this being squared. F2 equals F1, A2 over A1, which equals mg pi r squared over pi r squared. Oh, this is a radius of 5. I have to turn that into an area. So this area is uh, like a 20 pi r squared or pi squared. So squared pi over five squared pi. The pi's cancel out, but the four is squared. So it's not just four in here, this is four squared. So instead of 2,000,
it should be 8,000 newtons. That's what they have here. All right. <clears throat> Archimedes principle. You've probably heard some versions of this story before. Archimedes, a physicist in ancient Greece, was tasked by his king to determine the metallic composition of certain crown given to the king as a gift. Archimedes knew that he could do this by finding the crown's volume and mass, which would allow him to find its density and compare that density to those of known metals. Weighing the crown would be easy enough, but he was having trouble finding a way to measure its volume without melting it down and ruining its workmanship. Then one day, while getting into his bath, the water that overflowed from the tum gave him the idea to submerge the crown in water and measure the volume of the displaced liquid, Eureka. The principle that derives from the story is one of Archimedes' lasting contributions to the physics, to the field of physics. Archimedes' principle deals with the buoyancy of objects when placed in a fluid. It helps us understand how ships stay afloat and why we feel lighter when we're swimming. The principle states that a body wholly or partially immersed in a fluid will be buoyed upwards by a force equal to the weight of the fluid that it displaces. Just as Archimedes' body and his crown cause the water level to rise in the tub, any object placed in a fluid will cause a volume of liquid fluid to be displaced equal to the volume of the object that is submerged. Because all fluids have density, the volume of fluid displaced will correspond to a certain mass of that fluid. The mass of the fluid displaced exerts a force equal to the weight against the submerged object. This force, which is always directed upward, is called the buoyant force, and its magnitude is given by F boy equals rho of the fluid volume of the fluid displaced times g, the force of gravity, which also equals rho, density of the fluid, volume of submerged times g. So here the volume of the submerged object is the same as the volume of the displaced fluid. All right. When an object is placed in a fluid, it will sink into the fluid only to the point at which the volume of displaced fluid exerts a force that is equal to the weight of the object. If the object becomes completely submerged, then the volume of displaced fluid still does not exert a buoyant force equal to the weight of the object. The object will accelerate downward and sink to the bottom. This will be the case if an object is more dense than the fluid it's in. A gold crown will sink to the bottom of the bathtub because it is more dense than water. On the other hand, an object that is less dense than water, such as a block of wood or an ice cube, will stop sinking and start floating because it is less dense than water. These objects will submerge enough of their volume to displace a volume of water equal to the object's weight. One way to conceptualize the buoyant force is that it is the force of the liquid trying to return to the space from which it is displaced, thus trying to push the object up and out of the water. This is an important concept because the buoyant force is due to the liquid itself, not the object. If two objects placed in a fluid displace the same volume of fluid, they will experience the same magnitude of buoyant force even if the objects themselves have different masses. How can one determine how much of a floating object lies below the surface? To do this, one can make comparisons of density or specific gravity. Remember that an object will float no matter what it is made of and no matter how much mass it has. If its average density is less than or equal to the density of the fluid, into which it is placed. If we express the object's specific gravity as a percent, this directly indicates the percent of the object's volume that is submerged. When the fluid is pure water, when the fluid is pure water. For instance, the density of ice, 0.92, so its specific gravity is 0.92. An ice cube floating on a glass of water has 92% of its volume submerged in the water. Only 8% is sitting above the surface. Therefore, any object with specific gravity less than or equal to 1 will float in water. Any object 
with a specific gravity greater than one will sink. A specific gravity of exactly one indicates that 100% of the object will be submerged, but it will not sink. Wooden block floats in the ocean and half its volume submerged. Find the density of the wood. Well, it's got to be half that of the seawater. So, five, 12.5. They went in with equations, but ultimately, all they really do is divide it by two, as I did, 512.5. All right. Water striders are insects that have the ability to walk on water. Water striders are able to glide across the water surface without sinking even though they are denser than water, because of a special property of liquids at the interaction between a liquid and a gas. Surface tension causes the liquid to form a thin but strong layer like a skin at the liquid's surface. Surface tension results from cohesion, which is the attractive force at a molecule of liquid fields towards other molecules of the same liquid. Consider the inner molecular forces between the separate molecules of liquid water. For those molecules below the surface, there are attractive inner attractive intermolecular forces coming from all sides. Those forces balance out. However, on the surface, the molecules only have these strong attractive forces from the molecules below them, which pulls the surface of the liquid toward the center. This establishes tension in the plane of the surface of the water. When there is an indentation on the surface, say caused by a water strider's foot, then the cohesion can lead to a net upward force. Another force that liquid molecules experience is adhesion which is the attractive force that a molecule of liquid feels towards the molecules of some other substance. For example, adhesive forces cause water molecules to form droplets on the windshield of a car even though gravity is pulling them downward. When liquids are placed in containers, a meniscus or curved surface in which the liquid crawls up the side of the container a small amount will form when the adhesive forces are greater than the cohesive forces. A backward convention meniscus with the liquid level higher in the middle than at the edges occurs when the cohesive forces are greater than the adhesive forces. Mercury, the only metal that is liquid at room temperature, forms a backward meniscus when placed in a container. Both types of menisci are shown in figure 4.2. Contrast cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is water adhering to water. Adhesion is water attraction, water's attraction to glass. What would the meniscus of a liquid that experiences equal cohesive and adhesive forces look like? It would be straight across. There would be no meniscus. A block is fully submerged three inches below the surface of a fluid, but is not experiencing any acceleration. What can be said about the displaced volume of fluid and the buoyant force? Uh, the buoyant force must be equal to the volume of displaced liquid times the force of gravity times the density of water. True or false, to determine the volume of an object by fluid displacement, it must have a specific gravity greater than one. Um, no, you could, st oh yeah, I guess, uh, I guess so, because it won't sink. To which side of a hydraulic lift would the operator usually apply a force? The side with the larger cross-sectional area or the side with the smaller cross-sectional area? The side with the smaller cross-sectional area because it would require less force. Can we double check these before we go on? Let's. Cohesion, uh, meniscus would be flat. Three, the displacement is equal to the volume of the block. Point force is equal to the weight of the block and is equal to the displaced fluid. By extension, the block of the fluid in which it is immersed must have the same density. What? So, so the point is that it's submerged but not sinking. So it's exactly so it's the same density as water, right? And uh, four false. 
A fluid with a low specific gravity can be used instead of water to determine volume of the object that would otherwise float in water. Their answer is to use something with a lower specific gravity. To which side of a hydraulic lift would the operator, operator usually apply a force that is the side with a smaller cross-section. All right. Fluid dynamics. As the term suggests, fluid dynamics is the study of fluids in motion. This is perhaps one of the most fascinating areas of physics because it, its applications to real life are everywhere. Many aspects of our world, from water delivery to our homes to blood flow through our our arteries and veins can be analyzed and explained, at least in part by the principles of fluid dynamics. The MCAP presents a relatively simplified version of the topic, making important assumptions such as rigid wall containers and uniform density of fluids. Viscosity. Some fluids flow very easily, while others barely flow at all. The resistance of a fluid is to flow is called viscosity. Increased viscosity of a fluid increases its viscous drag, which is a non-conservative force that is anal analogous to air resistance. Thin fluids like gases, water, and dilute aqueous solutions have low viscosity, and so they flow easily. Objects can move through these fluids with low viscous drag, while blood, whole blood, Vegetable oil, honey, cream, and molasses are thick fluids and flow more slowly. Objects can move through these fluids, but with significantly more viscous drag. All fluids except superfluids, which are not tested on the MCAT, are viscous to one degree or another. Those with lower viscosities are said to have behave more like ideal fluids, which have no viscosity and are described as inviscid. Because viscosity is a measure of a fluid's internal resistance to flow, more viscous fluids will lose more energy while flowing. Unless otherwise indicated, viscosity should be assumed to be negligible on test day, thus allowing Bernoulli's equation explained later in this chapter to be an expression of energy conservation for flowing fluids. The SI unit of viscosity is the Pascal second. Laminar and turbulent flow. When a fluid is moving, its flow can be laminar or turbulent. Laminar flow is smooth and orderly and is often modeled as layers of fluid that flow parallel to each other. The layers will not necessarily have the same linear speed. For example, the layers closest to the wall of a pipe flows more slowly than the more interior layers of fluid. While laminar flow through a pipe or confined space, with laminar flow through a pipe or confined space, it is possible to calculate the rate of flow using Poisson, 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 Poisson's law. Q equals pi r to the fourth. Delta rho or P, delta P, change in pressure, over 8 N L, where Q is the flow rate, R is the radius of the pipe, delta P is the pressure gradient, eta is the viscosity of the fluid, and L is the length of pipe. This equation is rarely tested in full. Most often, MCAT passages and questions focus on the relationship between the radius and pressure gradient. Note that the relationship between the radius and pressure gradient is inverse exponential to the fourth power. Even a very slight change in the radius of the tube has a significant effect on the pressure gradient, assuming a constant flow rate. Turbulence and speed. Turbulent flow is rough and disorderly. Turbulence causes the formation of eddies, which are swirls of fluid by varying sizes. Sorry. Turbulence 
Turbulent flow causes the formation of eddies, which are swirls of fluid of varying sizes occurring typically on the downstream side of an obstacle, as shown in figure 4.4. An unobstructed fluid flow, turbulence can arise when the speed of the fluid exceeds a certain critical speed. This critical speed depends on the physical properties of the fluid, such as the viscosity and the diameter of the tube. When the critical speed for a fluid is exceeded, the fluid demonstrates complex flow patterns, and laminar flow occurs only in the thin layer of fluid adjacent, adjacent to the wall, called the boundary layer. The flow speed immediately at the wall is zero and increases uniformly throughout the layer. Beyond the boundary layer, however, the motion is highly irregular and turbulent. A significant amount of energy is dissipated from the system as a re result of the increased frictional forces. Calculations of energy conservation, such as Bernoulli's equation, cannot be applied to turbulent flow systems. Luckily, the MCAT always assumes laminar non-turbulent flow for such questions. For a fluid flowing through a tube of diameter D, the critical speed Vc can be calculated. V sub C equals N eta rho. D, where V sub C is the critical speed, N sub R is a dimensionless constant called Reynolds number. Eta is the viscosity of the fluid. Rho is the density of the fluid. The Reynolds number depends on factors such as the size, shape, and surface roughness of any objects within the fluid. Streamlines. Because the movement of individual molecules of a fluid is impossible to track with the unaided eye, it is often helpful to use representations of the molecular movement called streamlines. Streamlines indicate the pathways followed by tiny fluid elements, sometimes called fluid particles, as they move. The velocity vector of a fluid particle will always be tangential to the streamline at any point. Streamlines never cross each other. Figure 4.5 shows a fluid with an invisible tube as it passes from P to Q. The streamlines indicate some but not all of the paths for the fluid along the walls of the tube. You'll notice that the tube gets wider toward Q as indicated by the streamlines that are spreading out over the increased cross-sectional area. This leads us to consider the relationship between flow rate and the cross-sectional area of the container through which fluid is moving. Once again, we can assume that the fluid is incompressible which means that we are not considering a flowing gas. Because a fluid is incompressible, the rate at which a given volume or mass of fluid passes by one point must be the same for all points in the closed system. This is essentially an expression of conservation of matter. If x liters of fluid pass a point in a given amount of time, then x liters of fluid must pass all other points in the system in the same amount of time. Thus, we can very clearly state without any exceptions the flow rate that is, the volume per unit time, is constant for a closed system and is independent of changes in cross-sectional area. While the flow rate is constant, the linear speed of the fluid does change relative to cross-sectional area. Linear speed is a measure of linear displacement of fluid particles. In a given amount of time, notably, the product of linear speed and cross-sectional area is equal to the flow rate. We've already said that the volumetric rate of flow for fluid must be constant throughout a closed system. Therefore, Q equals V1 A1, which equals V2 A2, and so on. where Q is the flow rate, V1 and V2 are the linear speeds of the fluids at points 1 and 2, respectively, and A1 and A2 are the cross-sectional areas at these points. These equations is, this equation is known as a continuity equation, and it tells us that fluids will flow more quickly through narrow passages and more slowly through wider ones. Therefore, in figure 4.5 earlier, while the flow rate at points P and Q are the same, the linear speed is faster at point P than Q. Flow rates are the same. Linear speed is not the same. All right, Bernoulli's equation. 
Before we cover Bernoulli's equation itself, let's approach a flowing fluid from two perspectives that we've already discussed. First, the continuity equation arises from the conservation of mass of fluids. Liquids are essentially incompressible, so the flow rate within a closed space must be constant at all points. The continuity equation shows us that for a constant flow rate, there is an inverse relationship between the linear speed of the fluid and the cross-sectional area of the tube. Fluids have higher speeds through narrower tubes. Second, fluids that have low viscosity and demonstrate laminar flow can also be approximated to be conservative systems. The total mechanical energy of the system is constant if we discount the small viscous drag forces that occur in all real liquids. Combining these principles of conservation, we arrive at Bernoulli's equation. Mm. P1 plus 1 half PV1 squared plus rho g h1 equals p2 plus 1 half p v2 squared plus rho g h squared g h2, where p is the absolute pressure of the fluid, rho is the density of the fluid, v is the linear speed, g is the acceleration due to gravity, and h is the height of the fluid above some datum. Some of the terms of Bernoulli's equation should look vaguely familiar. The term 1 half PV squared is sometimes called the dynamic pressure and is the pressure associated with the movement of a fluid. 1 half rho V squared. This term is essentially the kinetic energy of the fluid divided by the volume. The term Rho GH looks like the expression for gravitational potential energy and is essentially the pressure associated with the mass of fluid sitting above some position. Finally, let's consider how the absolute pressure fits into, the, into this conservation equation. If one multiplies the unit of pressure, newtons per meter squared, by meters over meters, we obtain newton meters per meters cubed which equals joules per meters cubed. Pressure can therefore be thought of as a ratio of energy per cubic meter, or energy density. Systems at higher pressure have a higher energy density than systems at lower pressure. Finally, the combination of P plus rho GH gives us the static pressure, and is the same equation as that for absolute pressure, although H is used here to imply height above a certain point, whereas Z was used earlier to imply depth below a certain point. Bernoulli's equation states, then, that the sum of the static pressure and dynamic pressure will be constant within a closed container for an incompressible fluid not experiencing viscous drag. In the end, Bernoulli's equation is nothing other than a statement of energy conservation. More energy dedicated towards fluid movement means less energy dedicated towards static fluid pressure. The inverse of this is also true. Less movement means more static pressure. One example of this principle that you may have previously encountered is how the shape of an airplane's wings help generate lift. Propeller and jet engines generate thrust by pushing air backwards. In both cases, because the wing top is curved, air streaming over it must travel faster and thus faster than air pass and thus faster than air passing underneath the flat bottom. According to Bernoulli's equation, the slower air below exerts more force on the wing than the faster air above, thereby lifting the plane. Another example of Bernoulli's equation in action is the use of pilot tubes. These are specialized measurement devices that determine the speed of fluid flowing by determining the difference between the static and dynamic pressure of the fluid at given points along a tube. A common application of Bernoulli's equation on the MCAT is the Venturi flow meter, as shown in 4.7. When considering Bernoulli's equation in this example, start by noting that the average height of the tube itself remains constant. Therefore, rho gh remains constant at points 1 and 2. Note that the h shown in figure 4.7 is the difference in height between the two columns at points 1 and 2. The linear speed must increase according to the continuity equation. 
uh, between the two point columns at points one and two, not h from Bernoulli's equation, which corresponds to the average height of the tube above a datum. As the cross-sectional area decreases from point one to two, the linear speed must increase according to the continu continuity equation. Then as the dynamic pressure increases, the absolute pressure must decrease at point two. With a lower absolute pressure, the column of fluid sticking up from the Venturi tube will be lower at point two. This phenomenon is also often called the Venturi effect. An office building with a bathroom 40 meters above the ground has its water supply enter the building at ground level through a pipe with an inner diameter of four centimeters. If the linear speed at the ground floor is two meters per second, and at the bathroom is eight meters per second, determine the cross-sectional area of the pipe in the bathroom. If the pressure in the bathroom is three times 10 to the fifth pascals, what is the required pressure at ground level? So first let's determine the cross-sectional area. So. An office building with a bathroom 40 meters above the ground has a four centimeter pipe, two meters per second, goes eight meters per second through the other end of the pipe. Determine the cross sectional area at that other end. All right. So we're going to use this uh, equation over here. The volume squared. I forget if these are rows or p's. These are rows. Row, row. We're using water, so row's got to be 1. Are we going to... Mess with the force of gravity? No, they use straight up 9.8. They don't do that. Okay, so this is for pressure. First, we're going to do uh, this equation to get the flow rate. Or rather, we know the flow rate is the same. And we know the You know the volume or the cross section? V1, A1. Where V is the flow rate and A is the area. So a four centimeter diameter pipe is a two centimeter radius. Mm. Two centimeter radius times pi r squared, or uh, times squared times pi. That area times two meters per second. equals uh, whatever the other R is. Wow. Eight per second doing that right so far they have these uh, so areas in meters so we do have to turn centimeters into meters here because we're doing meters per second so we'll turn that two into uh, 
two centimeters is one two point oh two point oh two meters squared times two equals Still good on that? We're still good on that? So let's just use a calculator on that, right? 0 0.02 times 0 0.02 times 2 times, and I have pi on here. I could have sworn there was a pi on here. Yeah, pi. So that's everything on this side. And I'm going to divide by. I'm going to divide by pi anyways. Divided by 8. And now I want the square root of that. And so r is 0.01, I think. They have this 3.14 because they got the pi in there still. All right. Times ten to the negative fourth. The first question is, uh, determine the cross-sectional area of the pipe in the bathroom. So the cross-sectional area cross-sectional area being 3.14, if you divide that by pi, you get one, right? Like the radius is one, but right, the area is uh, 3.14. I still feel like I have too big of a number though, because now this times 0.01 is times pi is the area. Whereas the area is point oh 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 three one four because zero point oh one squared times pi equals this. All right. And then the pressure is this other equation. P1 plus 1 half. 
we're talking about water here. The velocity at that first end was two square plus one times nine point eight times H that was at a height of No, wait a minute now. Which one? The the second one's at a height of 40. The first one's at zero. So they're doing this uh, interesting thing here. Rows like we guessed one, but in this case they're using one thousand. The pressure at two is what they gave us three times ten to the fifth. The pressure in the bathroom. What is required pressure at ground level? We're trying to find P1. So they put it in terms of P1. Let's just make sure we have all the terms right here. Uh, so yeah, we do have to change our row to 1,000. Both of these are going to be 1,000. Uh, Same thing over here, 8 minus 2, 2 meters squared over 2, 9.8, 40 meters. Which is H2 minus H1. The way they do it is handy, because the way I was going to do it, if I put 40 on one side and 0 on the other, it would just be 0 on that side, right? But that's okay. So my instinct, like I said, would be to fill this out the way they got it up here and then start canceling terms out. Let's see if that works without combining terms like they did. As long as we got all the terms in there correct, it should still work out, right? So you replace the ones with thousands. 9.8 times one side is going to have a 0. The other side is going to have a 40. Let's see if that works out in the end. This is going to equal P, oh man, P2 plus one half, 1,000. And then over here on this side, um, what was it, four? Eight? Eight meters per second. Eight meters per second plus row another thousand. Row G nine point eight H this time is forty. Yeah, this should work out, right? If we just uh, do some calculating, I think this will work out. Let's see. Nine 
9.8 times 40 times 1,000. And they told us that the pressure, this P2 value is also uh, 30,000. That's one, two, three, four. Oh, that's four. 300,000. Plus, let's do an eight squared times a thousand. Divided by two. Three hundred thousand plus thirty two thousand plus three hundred and ninety two thousand should equal. And I'm just going to move this stuff down. This whole side, this part is zero. Two times two is four. Four times a thousand is four thousand. Divided by two is two thousand. So this whole side should reduce to 2,000 plus P1. And then over here we got 32,000 plus 300,000 plus 392,000. I'm going to take that number and subtract that 2,000 to get what I think is our answer of 722 zero, zero, zero. 722 times 10 to the 5th. Is that 10 to the 5th? Yeah. Yay, we got it right. Before you move on, assess your understanding of the materials. Define the terms dynamic pressure, static pressure. Dynamic pressure, I guess, is when fluid's moving past a wall the amount of pressure it puts on the wall. Static pressure is if there's no movement, the amount of pressure. Pilot tube is a device that has both areas, that, that measures both dynamic and static pressure to calculate the density of a fluid, I think. Viscosity is just the speed at which a fluid moves. Laminar flow is smooth movement where the lines are parallel. Turbulent flow is when it's moving too fast, it, uh, the lines aren't parallel anymore and there's wasted energy in there. How do the following concepts relate to one another? Venturi effect, Bernoulli, Bernoulli's equation, and continuity equation. What relationship does each describe? Continuity equation is that the velocity at different parts of the system have to be the same, right? So if the volume or the, the pressure has to be the same at different points, so if the volume changes and the speed has to increase. Uh, here uh, we're using that uh, if the speed is increased, then the pressure is against the walls is going to be less. So uh, that's, I guess, how Bernoulli... Uh, so Bernoulli is that the higher the speed, the less pressure against the walls. Uh, putting those two together, you get this Venturi effect where... Uh, yeah, because the higher velocity here to keep the pressure the same... You have less pressure, less force against the walls. And so you can see how that changed the water level there. What variable does flow rate depend on? Flow rate depends on the, the pressure and the uh, surface area or the area of the, the area that is flowing through, the area of the pipe or tube. How are we doing? Fluids and physiology. We're almost done. Should we check those answers before we go on? Let's check those answers. Make sure we got those right. Dynamic pressure is a pressure associated with flow. Static pressure associated with position. Pilot tube is a device for measuring static pressure.
viscosity is the measure of the resistance of a liquid to flow. Laminar flow is where there are no eddies. Turbulence is with the uh, presence of eddy currents. The continuity equation describes the relationship of flow and cross-sectional area in a tube, while Bernoulli's equation describes the relationship between height, pressure, and flow. The Venturi effect is the direct relationship between cross-sectional area and pressure and results from the combined relationship of the Bernoulli and continuity equations. Flow rate depends on the radius of the tube, pressure gradient, viscosity, and length of the tube. Okay, so not just the area and the pressure, but also the viscosity and length of the tube. All right. As a future student of medicine, you may feel that the abstract application of physics and math can often seem unimportant and tedious. However, these disciplines are exceptionally important in physiology. The movement of blood, lymph, and air throughout the body and lungs follow basic principles of fluid dynamics and pressure with some minor alterations. We will focus primarily on the circulatory system, but also briefly describe, discuss pressure and flow as they relate to gas exchange. Circulatory system is a closed loop that has a non-constant flow rate. This non-constant flow is a result of valves, gravity, physical properties of our vessels, elasticity in particular, and the mechanics of the heart. In particular, the non-constant flow can be felt and measured as a pulse. In addition to these features, there is a loss of volume from the circulation as a result of a difference between osmotic oncotic and hydrostatic pressures. This fluid is eventually returned to the circulation as a result of lymphatic flow, but it is problematic for applications of the continuity equation. An important point to note is that despite these differences, blood volume entering the heart is always equal to blood volume leaving the heart during a single cycle. As blood flows away from the heart, each vessel has a progressively higher resistance until the capillaries. However, the total resistance of the system decreases because the increased number of vessels are in parallel with each other. Like parallel resistors in circuit, the equivalent resistance is therefore lower for the capillaries in parallel than the aorta. Return flow to the heart is facilitated by mechanical squeezing of the skeletal muscles, which increases pressure in the limbs and pushes blood to the heart, and the expansion of the heart, which decreases pressure in the heart and pulls blood in. Finally, the pressure gradients created in the thorax by inhalation and exhalation also motivate blood flow. Venous circulation holds approximately three times as much blood as arterial circulation. Heart murmurs, which result from structural defects of the heart, are heard because of turbulent blood flow. The respiratory system is also mediated by changes in pressure and follows the same resistance relationship as the circulatory system. During inspiration, there is a negative pressure gradient that moves air into the lungs. During expiration, this gradient reverses. An additional point to note is that when air reaches the alveoli, it has essentially no speed. Before you move on, assess your understanding of the materials. Under what conditions could the continuity equation be applied to human circulation? I guess within an organ, like within the heart. Uh, during exhalation, how does the total resistance of the encountered airway change as air leaves the alveoli to escape the nose? And during exhalation, how does the total resistance of the encountered air change as air leaves the alveoli to escape the nose and mouth? What, what does that mean, leaves the alveoli to escape the nose and mouth? The alveoli are not in the nose or mouth. So from the alveoli to the mouth. During the exhalation, how does the total resistance change? I guess there's more resistance down in the alveoli. There's less in the nose and mouth. So... But total resistance would be the same because it's one closed system. Speed will change between the alveoli and the mouth. But resistance should be the same. That's my guess. How does flow in the ve vena cava relate to flow in the main pulmonary artery? The vena cava is a vein, right? That's everything coming back into the heart. Uh, and the pulmonary artery is pushing out, but the pulmonary artery is reversed, right? The pulmonary artery But 
still, it's being pumped, so it'll have a high. So they should both have a high pressure. Uh, the, the the vena cava. No, this uh, pulmonary artery should have a higher pressure because it's being pumped. Vena cava is, uh, right, like slower velocity on the vena cava. That's what I'm going to guess. Let's see. Continuity occasion can't be applied to the circulatory system. Uh, total resistance increases as the air exits the body. The body, despite the increase in the diameter of the airways, this is because there are fewer airways in parallel with each other. Okay. In theory, there should be equal flow in the vena cava and the pulmonary trunk. In reality, the flow in the vena cava is actually less than the pulmonary trunk because some of the blood entering the right side of the heart is actually from cardiac coronary circulation, not this system systemic circulation. Okay. Almost done. We got some practice questions. All right. Objects A and B are submerged at a depth of one meter. Number one. In a liquid with a specific gravity of 0 0.877. Given that the density of object B is one-third that of object A, and that the gauge pressure of object A is three atmospheres, what is the gauge pressure of object B? Assume atmospheric pressure is one, and the force of gravity is 9.8. Specific gravity. Density. Gauge pressure. Gauge pressure is absolute pressure minus atmospheric pressure. Absolute pressure is P naught plus rho GZ. Let's start filling this in. So P plus rho G Z minus atmospheric pressure. So here, gauge pressure of object A is 3 ATM. And so if object B is one third the density. And it'll be three times because it's inverse. Specific gravity, rho over one. So if the density, no, that's, that's something else. That's, we're, we're over here. PGZ, rho GZ. So if the density is one third, then gauge pressure should also be a third, right? I'm going to say one. Okay. 
You'll find out in a minute. Number two, an anchor made of iron weighs 833 newtons. On the deck of a ship, if anchor is now suspended in seawater by a massless chain, what is the tension in the chain? So we know that iron is denser than seawater. So it'll sink. So all we really get from this density is that it sinks. So I'm just going to go with 833. 2C. Two, Two wooden balls of equal volume have different density are held beneath the surface of a container of water. Ball A has a density of 0.5 and ball B has a density of 0.7. When the balls are released, they will accelerate upward to the surface. What is the relationship between acceleration of ball A and that of ball B? Uh, the force will be greater for uh, ball A. So A will accelerate faster. Ball A has a greater acceleration. 3A. 4. Water flows from a pipe of diameter 0.15 into one of diameter 0.2. If the speed in the 0.15 millimeter pipe is eight, what is the speed in the 0.2 meter pipe? So it's flowing into a bigger diameter, so the speed will decrease. And by how much? Let's use uh, this. Four. Let's see. Two. Doing some crazy stuff, isn't it? Uh, so the point is uh, pi r squared. Oh, fun. Eight meters per second times pi point one five squared equals two pi times point two squared. So let's find the velocity. 
in that second pipe. Point one five times point one five times eight. I could divide by pi, but I'm just going to divide by pi again. So point one eight two times point two point oh four point one eight divided by point oh four. equals 4.5. So it's going to be C. Number five, a hydraulic lever is used to lift a heavy hospital bed requiring an amount of work W. When the same bed with a patient is lifted, the work required is double. How can the cross-sectional area of the platform on the bed, which the bed is lifted, be changed so that the pressure on the hydraulic lever remains constant? The cross-sectional area must be doubled, must be halved, must be divided by four, must remain constant. I would have said it would have been divided by 4 because that's what that one uh, equation tells us. This R4 thing, right? But there isn't an option. So I guess I'm going to go with A. Maybe it's divided by 4. Yeah, we'll go with C. Let's double check because I'm curious. 5. 5 is A. This question tests our understanding of Pascal's principle, which states that a change in pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to every portion of the fluid into the walls of the containing vessel. We are told that the work required to lift the bed with the patient is doubled, double the work needed to lift just the bed. In other words, the force required doubles when the, both the bed and the patient ha have to be lifted. To maintain the same pressure, we must double the cross-sectional area of the platform of the hydraulic lever on which the patient and the bed are lifted. Okay. What did we say? A? Six. The figure shown represents a section through a horizontal pipe of varying diameters into which four open vertical pipes connect. If water is allowed to flow through the pipe in the direction indicated, in which of the vertical pipes will the water level be lowest? So the pressure is the same at each of these points, which means the velocity goes up and then down and then down to the original. So I think the level will be the same here and here. It'll be less here, but it'll be lowest here. I think we got to go with B. The speed of blood in the aorta is much higher than the speed of blood through a capillary bed. How can this fact be explained using continuity equation, assuming that we are interested in average flow and that there is no net fluid loss? So the continuity equation was that uh, as the radius, as the size of the piping goes down, the pressure remains the same, so the velocity must increase. So let's see, the aorta is located higher than the capillary bed. Speed of blood in the aorta is much higher than the speed of blood through a capillary bed. How can this fact be explained using the continuity equation? Oh, because there's a lot more capillaries in parallel. They compared it to like an electrical circuit. So is it that the aorta is located higher? I don't think so. The pressure in the aorta is the same as the pressure in the capillary. The, well, that is the continuity equation. 
the cross-sectional area of all the capillaries added together is much greater than the cross-sectional area of the aortic. I'm going to go with that one. The cross-sectional area of a capillary is much smaller than the cross-sectional area of the aorta. Yeah, 7C. 8. Which of the following data sets to sufficient sets is sufficient to determine the linear speed through an area of a rigid pipe? Cross-sectional area in another segment of pipe and the cross-sectional area in the region of interest? Sure. The Reynolds number, viscosity of the fluid and the diameter of the pipe, the radius of the pipe, pressure gradient, viscosity and length of the pipe, the absolute pressure and density. What's the Reynolds number again? Reynolds number, does that have to do with viscosity? Doesn't that have to do with viscosity already? Reynolds number N is the viscosity of the fluid. So when they say Reynolds number and viscosity of the fluid, that's just screaming mistake to me. So I'm going to go with C. Large cylinders filled with equal volumes of two immiscible fluids. The balloon is submerged in the first fluid. The, the gauge pressure in the balloon at the deepest point in the first fluid is found to be three atmospheres. Next, the balloon is lowered all the way down to the bottom of the second fluid, where the hydrostatic pressure on the balloon reads eight atmospheres. What is the ratio of the gauge pressure accounted for by the first fluid to the gauge pressure accounted for by the second fluid? I mean, I want to say three to eight, because no other numbers really match. <laughs> so D. A hydraulic system is designed to allow water levels to change depending on a force applied to the top of the tank as shown. If a force F of 4 newtons is applied to a square flexible cover where A1 equals 16 and the area A2 equals 64, what force must be applied to A2 to keep the water levels from changing? Well, this is 4 times the area. I'm going to say four times, 32, C. Balls A and B of equal mass, shown below, are fully submerged in a swimming pool, which calls for, which ball will produce the greater buoyant force? Well, since this one displaces more water, there'll be more buoyant force on ball A. Go with A. 12. Bernoulli's equation is the reason for the upward force that permits airplane fight. Which statements best summarizes the equation's relationship to flight? The speed of airflow is equal on the top and bottom of a wing, resulting in non-turbulent flight. The speed of airflow is greater over the curved top of the wing, resulting in less pressure on the top of the wing, and the product production of a net upward force in the wing, in turn resulting in flight. That sounds right. The speed of airflow on the bottom is greater. That's wrong. The weight of the wing is directly proportional to the weight of the air it displaces. Now, 12 is going to be B. Thirteen, a low pressure weather system can decrease the atmospheric pressure from one atmosphere to 0.99 atmospheres. By what percent will this decrease the force on a rectangular window from the outside? Assuming the window is 6 meters by 3 meters and the glass is 3 centimeters thick. J. 
change in pressure of 1%, I'm going to go with 1%, 13. A, 14, two fluids, A and B, have densities X and 2X, respectively. They are tested independently to assess absolute pressure as at varying depths. At what depths will the pressure below the surface of these two fluids be equal? Four times. R to the fourth. Let's go with D. Fifteen. A water tower operator is interested in increasing the pressure of a column of water that is applied to a piston. She hopes that increasing the pressure will increase the force being applied to the piston. The only way to increase the pressure is to alter the speed of the water as it flows through the pipe to the piston. How should the speed of the water be changed to increase the pressure and force? I guess increase the speed, 15A. I'm going to go back to 14 because I realize that it can't be four times. It's the, four times was the uh, change in uh, like the pipe size and how much it affects speed. This is depth underwater. It's not going to be four times. It's going to be two times. I'm going to change it to C. All right, one. I said A. They said C. The absolute engaged pressures dependent, depend only on the density of the fluid, not that of the object. When the pressure at the surface is equal to atmospheric pressure, the gauge pressure is given by P gauge equals PGZ, where P represents the density of the fluid, not the object. These objects are also the same depth, so they must have the same gauge pressure. They have the same gauge pressure. It's not going to be one-third. It is three. C. Okay. C. Two. B. I said C. The tension in the chain is the difference between the anchor's weight and the buoyant force. So, uh, so they did, they did 833 times the ratio of the specific of the density of water and the density of the iron. And that comes out to, uh, what, 724? Let's find ourselves. What was this for number two? Number two, eight. 33 times 1025 over 7, Eight thirty-three times one zero two five divided by seven eight zero zero is around a hundred. Okay. B or A? Two was B. Lastly, we attain the tension from the initial equation. So we add or we subtract that from 833. So 833 minus 109 equals 724 B. Okay. So what did we do there? The tension is the force of gravity minus the, minus the buoyant force. The buoyant force is 
the density of water, the volume of water, gravity. The volume of the water displaced is equal to the volume of the anchor, is equal to the mass divided by its density. We are not giving the anchor's mass, but its value must be the magnitude of the weight of the anchor divided by g. Putting all this together, we can obtain the buoyant force. Pw equals Vg, and V equals mass over density. Uh, but since there's a mass equals four force over gravity, we know what the force is, so these g's cancel out. And then you just get a force divided by Pa. So that's the density of the anchor. So you have the density of the water over the density of the anchor times the force of the anchor, which they said is 833 newtons. So that's how we get the buoyant force, and then that force of gravity, 833, minus that buoyant force is the tension. All right, that was pretty complicated. Three is A. We did good. 4, C, nice, 5, A, 6, B, 7, C, 8, C, 9, B, not D. The first step in answering this question is defining the different types of pressure. Atmospheric pressure is the pressure at the top of the fluid, at the top of the first fluid exerted by air. Gauge pressure is the pressure inside the balloon above and beyond beyond it, atmospheric pressure. Gauge pressure is the total pressure inside the balloon minus the atmospheric pressure. Gauge pressure depends on the density of the fluid, the constant of gravity, and the depth at which the object is submerged. Hydrostatic or absolute pressure is the total pressure in the balloon. That is the gauge pressure and the atmospheric pressure together. Because we are given the gauge pressure at the bottom of the first fluid at 3 atm, our task now is to calculate the gauge pressure accounted for by the second fluid. Hydrostatic pressure at the bottom of the cylinder is eight atmospheres. One of these atmospheres is atmospheric pressure pushing on the fluids. Another, another three atmospheres are accounted for by the first fluid that is pushing on the second fluid. Thus, the gauge pressure due to the second fluid is eight minus one minus three, four atmospheres. The ratio of the gauge pressure is therefore three to four. So 3 to 8, 8 minus 3 minus 1 is 4, so the ratio is 3 to 4. Okay, I don't know how you're supposed to figure that out. That seems pretty difficult to me. 10. B. I said C. This is a basic restatement of Pascal's principle that a force applied to an area will be transmitted through a fluid. This will result in changing fluid levels through the system. The relationship is stated as F2 equals F1 A2 over A1. Plugging in the numbers gives an answer of 16 newtons. 10. Yeah, I don't know why I said 32. The area is four times. So the force should be four times, 16. Why did I say 32? I did some bad math in my head. 10B. 11. A. 12. B. 13, A, 14, C, 15, 
B, not A. This is a basic interpretation of Bernoulli's equation that states, at equal heights, speed and pressure of a fluid are inversely related. The Venturi effect. Decreasing the speed of the water will therefore increase its pressure. An increase in pressure over a given area will result in increased force being transmitted to the piston. So this is Bernoulli, not uh, the continuity equation. This is Bernoulli that we're using. I was thinking a continuity equation that if you, you know, decrease the size of the pipe, the speed increases. But this is force by the fluid on the object. There's going to be less force by the fluid on the object the faster it goes. So this is Bernoulli's principle, not the continuity equation. 15B. All right. That's it for this chapter. Next chapter is electrostatics and magnetism. Thanks for watching.